Welcome to Discovering. I'm at Rainbow's End Alpacas in Norway and it's time for these guys to get a haircut. It's a really busy day here on the farm. They really, really need this. They have a really hard time handling the summer. And the Taxidermy 2017 World Champion. Stick around, that's all tonight right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Alpaca is a domesticated species of South American camelid, a family that includes camels and llamas. They've been domesticated for thousands of years and there are no known wild alpacas. Alpacas resemble llamas but are considerably smaller and unlike llamas, they're not bred to be beasts of burden, but were bred specifically for their fiber. Alpaca fiber is used for making knitted and woven items similar to wool. In order to find out how that fiber gets from the alpaca to that pair of socks in my drawer, I stopped in at Rainbow's End Alpacas in Norway on shearing day. We have been raising alpacas for 12 years now. Uh, one day my husband just came to me and said I'd like to raise something because we had five acres and I love animals, so I said good deal. And we just didn't really have anything in mind, but we, I just went to the fair that year and the alpacas for some reason really, really got my attention that year. And so um, we started doing some research and it was a bit out of our price range at the time, but then he had some stocks to reinvest a year later, and so then we really started doing our research and checking into them as a business, and as they say, the rest is history. We started out with uh, three girls and two boys. We have probably, over the years, probably had about 70 animals here at least that we have bred and, and sold. So we went into it with the idea of breeding and selling the animals. The store came along three years after we started and kind of changed our focus. A lot of people think we're just a yarn store, but we're much more than that. We do have a large supply of quality yarns in the store, natural yarns, wools, but of course heavy on alpaca. Uh, that's not hard to do because every uh, company, you know, commercial company for yarns has a lot of lines of with alpaca in it because it's such a fabulous fiber. We have alpaca apparel. Our socks are by far our biggest seller. Uh, even summer socks. Alpaca works in a way that it insulates against cold and heat. So even in the summer a lot of people can wear alpaca because it helps wick any moisture away from your feet when you're out even you know walking or doing whatever in the summertime. But in the winter it's the it's just its claim to fame is just its warmth and its softness. A lot of people that have collections of smart wool are now getting more and more alpaca socks. The wicking alone is incredible, just incredible. So your boots can be wet and you can put your alpaca socks and your feet are gonna stay dry. They really are. Word gets out. We, we have some doctors in the area that actually recommend to their patients that have neuropathy and different things like that to come and get alpaca socks. We've got one pair that are really good for uh, diabetics because it has a really stretchy cuff. So it doesn't cut off circulation, super soft and extremely warm. 
really, really comfortable. And so the store kind of became more of the business than um, the raising and selling because in part, I don't sell real well. <laughs> I like to keep everybody, but that doesn't work. So we have, we have sold several times. We have a couple farms here that um, they are people that bought from us before. And so they bring their animals back to get shorn every year. <laughs> now they generally don't like being handled and that's the only thing that's bad about alpacas in my opinion is they don't want to be cuddled they they get very nervous they get very scared this is a stressful day for them they don't um, you know no one is ever hurt or harmed but this is just scary for them because it's in a, a, a enclosed place it's people that are handling them that they don't know there's commotion around but they really really need this done every year because if they don't they have a really hard time handling the summer with the heat they're much more acclimated to our winters than they are hot summers people that raise them down south they have to make sure that they have really good cooling systems. So with alpaca shearing, we uh, usually start out, the guys take the animal down and stretch it out for me to secure it safely. Uh, they'll take care of the toenails and uh, check the teeth for me. Um, they'll get the blanket ready to roll the, roll the best uh, number one fiber over it. So I'll come over to the animal and I'll take the number ones, which is the blanket of the animal, off first. And that's the best stuff that they'll usually use for, for the nicer yarn and whatnot. So I'll shear that off, pull it off, and that's when the helpers will roll it up uh, so that they can skirt it later and clean it off and, and spin it into yarn. Um, then I'll move on to the legs and tail and shape it nicely. Pretty much every cut I do is, is the standard show cut. I just assume that every animal is going to show, even if they aren't. Try to make them look nice and, and shape the tail and shape the top knot. Just the neck is the second best fiber, um, so people can use that for yarn. And then here at this farm, they're just using the thirds, which is everything else besides the neck and, and blanket uh, for putting all together and making rugs. And they use it for scrap around landscaping and stuff. So we uh, check their teeth and we trim them down. A pack is front teeth keep uh, keep growing, so you got to trim them down every year, every two years. Um, I use a toothomatic, which is a, pretty much a four-inch angle grinder with a stone blade on it. So I kind of grind it down and make it nice and level with their pad to make it easier for them to eat. So the toenails, they, uh, they keep growing and you got to trim them. Most people will trim them. Um, some people do it once a month, some people do it once a quarter. You want to do it at least more than once a year. Some people still have us, only do it when we have them tied up because they can't handle the animals very well. Um, but they keep growing and the more they grow, they kind of start curling around. So you want to, uh, once they get curled, they start walking with a limp and it could cause knee damage and, and whatnot. Um, so yeah, you want to keep them trimmed so they can walk better. Uh, we work on a four-man team. I have my two takedown guys and uh, my wife holds the head for me. So we kind of bounce back and forth. Every time I'm shearing an animal, they'll prepare the next animal for me so that I can continue to shear and get more done in a day that way. 
After I'm done, we don't want to get second cuts, which is second cuts is uh, just like little pieces of fiber in the nice fiber. Um, so every, once I shear, there's a little bit of lines left over from what I've done. So I don't usually do that. Um, my second guy, uh, Ben Holcomb, will come behind me and do the cleanup shearing. And that's kind of a nice process for him to start learning how to shear himself as well. So the plan is he's kind of an apprentice right now. He's going to start shearing eventually on his own as well. So he kind of follows up and kind of cleans them up, makes them look nice. And that way he gets to kind of study the contours of the animal's body as well. So he can kind of begin to learn how to shear as well. So I specialize in alpacas. We also shear llamas. I can shear sheep, but I don't specialize in that. I'm not a great sheep shearer. I'm a very good alpaca shearer. I've been shearing alpacas for about eight years. Um, started as an apprenticeship, kind of doing what, like I spoke with about Ben doing, the cleanup shearing and taking down. Started as a wrangler, and, and I've worked on about 25,000 alpacas at this point in my career, and plan to keep going. Um, so it keeps us busy. It's a short season. We usually start uh, early April and shear till mid June, because um, you got to shear them in the spring before it gets too hot, and you know after the snow still. So there's kind of a, a tight window. So we work five or six days a week with one, one or two days off to. Uh, you know, rest and do laundry and continue on. So it's a busy season. We cram it in, and then we all have other gigs we do the rest of the year. And it's fun. We have to shear them every year, um, or, or some some well package you can shear once every two years. But it's advisable to shear them every year, especially um, in North America. It's it's hotter uh, during the year. They're native to the Andes Mountains, um, where it's cooler. They're not it's not necessary to shear them as often. You have to shear them up here, or else they could die of heat stroke. There's severe risk. You know, people can get around it with pools or, or spraying them off. But uh, best animal health is to shear them every year. So that's kind of a, a necessity to do. It's a really busy day here on the farm. We try to get. Uh, we have a lot of demonstrations going on in, inside. We've got a couple of ladies that are doing some spinning. One of them is a national award winner for her lace spinning. We have a couple ladies that are going to be doing weaving and we have a lady that is doing tatting. And then we have a lady this year that is uh, going to show people how to dye yarn. And then we're going to sell little skeins uh, that she has dyed. So we try to have a lot of different things on the fiber end so that people can get a full education when they come up here and see it right from coming off of the animal to the finished products. So the animal temperaments, I mean, it, there's some farms we shear every year and sometimes it's just random which animals are going to be spooked that day, um, but probably a good 40-50% of the animals we, we handle and, and take down to shear will we'll scream or send a warning call or spit and pee and we kind of got to deal with that. My guys do a great job, uh, Jake Hemrick and Ben Holcomb handling them and wrangling them and dealing with all that crazy stuff for me. They get kicked on and spit on and bucked around, but they do a good job uh, handling the animals real gently. And, uh, you know, you got to be firm, but you got to be gentle at the same time and take care of them and time up real well. So, so I used to shear in 39 different states every year. I would work for about four months straight, you know, start down south, get a little longer season. So we travel all around the country. Since then, I've kind of, uh, since I got married to my wife Alyssa, we've, we've cut it back trying to be home a little bit more. So I do most of my shearing in New York State now, and then we take a little stint out west to hit some farms out this way. Then, So next week we're heading home now. On the daily basis, raising alpacas is uh, actually quite easy. They get a half a cup of a grain that is specially formulated for them. They get a half a cup in the morning and a half a cup at night. Uh, they're primary grazers, so they like to graze. Uh, they have hay year-round because they also need the dry as well as the moist in the summer. They're a ruminant. They have three stomach chambers. So they really utilize everything that they take in. And their poo is actually the best fertilizer that's on the market. We sell it here in five gallon quantities. We bag it up into bags and people come back year after year for more of it because it not only is an excellent fertilizer, it's not harsh. You could actually take it right off the pile, the fresh pile if you want, because it is so um, broken down. It doesn't promote weeds and it it really gets crazy results with your gardens. We, um, so we always try to have that available, especially spring and fall. 
So on a daily basis, you know, once you do your feeding, make sure that they have uh, hay, grass, or water available all the time. They just kind of hang out. They're a very quiet animal. They make good neighbors. <laughs> But what we do here, we're not, we're not in a real wooded area where our farm is, but we still have the six foot no climb horse fence and that surrounds our entire property. And that's, that's almost more to keep other animals out than even them in. You can string a rope and, and they won't try to go past it unless they see a bleed of grass that they, <laughs> they think looks really good. They'll never leave their herd. We had one boy actually escape. Um, his pen area at night and he was laying right on the deck right by the rest of them because they don't want to go anywhere that their herd isn't. As long as you keep them safe and you know fed properly they really are a very easy animal to handle. They're not a real large animal. Right now they look bigger than they really are. They look pretty small after they get their hair cut. They usually are about 180 pounds, 170 pounds. We do have some bigger ones. A good portion of that reason is because we get so many guests here that they buy capsules of food, <laughs> and so they eat a little more than they should. But they're happy, <laughs> and they're healthy. The Upper Peninsula is home to a wealth of creative people of all kinds, and it's no wonder, based on where we live, that many of these artists focus on or are influenced by the outdoors. We love to hunt and fish. A great example is the art of taxidermy. Each year, competitions are held at various levels showcasing the work of some of the best taxidermists in the country. Last year at the National Taxidermy Championships in Pennsylvania, Tim Garenchen of North Country Legends Taxidermy in Escanaba won Judge's Choice Best of Show and National Champion Coldwater Fish with this amazing pink salmon. He followed that up this year with a trip to the World Taxidermy Championships held in Peoria, Illinois. The World Taxidermy Championships were held May 16th through the 20th, uh, so just, just a short time ago. Um, there were competitors from 12 countries represented, including the U.S., and there were almost 500 mounts. So the competition is the most prestigious taxidermy competition there is, um, second only to the European Championships. Each of those competitions are held every two years, um, so now there won't be another one until 2019. Um, there are 16 categories people compete in for best in world. You've got everything from life-size mammals, small, medium, and large, game heads, white tails, cold water fish, warm water fish. There's even a separate category for largemouth bass, game birds, waterfowl, non-game birds, such as raptors and songbirds and things like that. So it covers a very wide range of specimens and categories that people compete in. It was there at the World Championships that Tim was awarded World Champion Best in World Cold Water Fish with this amazing sockeye salmon. The way the competition works at a state show level, anything that scores 90 points or above is considered a first place. And then out of the first places, then you're awarded, if there's multiple ones, then you're awarded your state champion from their best of category. At the world level, the panel of judges go through and they score everything. Anything that scores over a 90 gets set aside into a separate class. And then of those entries, the panel of judges decide from there who's best in world, second in world, and third in world. So that's where you have a situation where if nobody, none of the entrants score over 90, you automatically don't have a best in world, second, or third. This past year was the first year in the history of the competition that all 16 titles were awarded for best in world. In 2015, um, there was no best in world title awarded for cold water fish or second or third. You may have heard the term museum quality taxidermy before, uh, but when you get to the higher levels of competition, it truly is museum quality. Um, you've got situations where, say if a guy's competing with a deer head, most instances he's sculpted that deer head from a skeleton, um, he's clayed it up out of a clay sculpture, made a mold of it, poured it uh, in foam. Um, every, all the pieces are reproduced. Like for instance, on a fish mount, a competition of that level, the head is molded and cast from the original. At one time this head was in, I believe it was five or six pieces before I put it all together. Uh, the eyes are hand painted. The fins are all molded and cast from the original fish. Um, the body, after making a template of it before it's skinned, the body is, is hand carved. Uh, back to the exact measurements it was before it was skinned and then all that is put back together. Um, all the unions are blended with epoxy and then the painting process begins from there. 
I, mean, I probably had over 300 hours into this piece. Now that level of time spent on a piece is not realistic for commercial taxidermy. It's just not practical from a business standpoint. However, uh, by going to competitions, you're putting your work out there, and these are judges from that have won best in world multiple times, uh, guys that are, in some cases, zoologists, fisheries biologists, guys that know these animals, these specimens inside and out. So you're getting critiqued on what you're doing right. They're teaching you what you can do better. And so you're gaining knowledge every time you go out and compete and you put the time into this piece and try and do it the absolute best that you can. And there again comes the term museum quality. It truly is museum quality. You're reproducing an animal or a fish, be it a bird, anything, is exactly as it was in life that's humanly possible. And so I can't spend that same level of time on a commercial piece, but what I can do is I can use that knowledge going into a commercial piece and I can use, I would say 80% of the techniques are practical to use on a commercial piece. So you might look at two items of taxidermy and say, wow, you know, that one looks better. You know, some of it's for obvious reasons, but a lot of it's just little subtleties that are, are characteristics of that animal per se that you might not even be aware of, but when you look at it, it's like, wow, that looks more alive. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it just looks better. And that's where that in-depth knowledge of the animals and fish and birds that you're working on really comes into play. I've also competed with deer heads, waterfowl, and life-size game. Focusing primarily on fish and competitions since 2012. Reason being, once you start and you're getting judges critiques, they're telling you how to improve on things, you kind of want to keep the ball rolling and incorporate what they're telling you and see you know, do it to the absolute best of your ability. Um, I also brought a deer head to the World Championships. Uh, there was a special award given to the highest scoring group of four mounts. So I brought three fish and my deer head. Uh, deer head I put together for the Wisconsin State Show. Um, ended up winning Taxidermist's Choice Best Whitetail at the State Show um, and scored well enough at Worlds to win me some money at the at the World Championships as well. So not just fish, I've, in competition wise, I focus primarily on them, but I welcome all different kinds of work. Well, that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been, go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering.